Our next uh, speaker, when I um, get ready to bring him up, is Dr. Gripal Tor. He uh, is one of our extension specialists that we rely heavily on for soil fertility and nutrient management. Today, I just wanted to have a conversation about how to keep your fields in the optimum nutrient range so you don't have any of the yield losses or other things like fluctuating fertilizer prices as we have going on this year. So this is the sort of agenda. Um, we'll spend quite a bit of time on nitrogen and phosphorus. And if you guys still have energy, then we'll dig into potassium and sulfur. So I'm sure you all know that the fertilizer prices are higher. Um, anyone wants to guess why are they higher? Okay. Yeah, okay, maybe we, we shouldn't. May I have heard that some people some people say there are rumors going around, and rumors don't increase fertilizer prices, right? So we all know that. So there, there are many things that are going on in the world at this point. In the last year, for example, there has been a very strong fertilizer demand. So if you look globally, there was 6% more demand than 2020. If we look within the country, we had about 2% more fertilizer demand. And this is because of COVID, a renewed emphasis on food, which is great for agriculture. Um, there also has been, as we all know, supply chain disruption, physical, economic, and geopolitical stuff that we currently have going on in Europe. Um, the energy prices also has been higher. There has been inflation, as we all are experiencing. Um, there's also domestic policies about some countries have also been different. Um, China, for example, um, had a freeze on export of fertilizer, other materials. Other countries, they limited how much you could, um, you know, export from those places. And some other things that we don't really pay attention, but when you think globally, everything is connected. We live in a connected world. Um, and Belarus, I'm sure you all have heard in the news right next to China, they had uh, human rights and other issues going on last year. So U.S. and the European Union placed restrictions on Belarus. And we don't really care about Belarus, but it's the, number, uh, it's the fifth top supplier of potash in the world. So if they are, other people are not able to get there, then there is going to be more demand in other parts of the world. Um, but you've all been farming for a while, and you know that the fertilizer prices fluctuate, right? And often we forget that the prices were actually higher at some point in time. Uh, this is a graph from USDA. Last time they were higher was in 2008 or 2009. Um, so, so there is nothing like this suddenly, this sudden increase that we didn't know. So these things have happened. They are going to happen in the, in the future as well. But what could you do on the farm to make sure that you don't have a strong need for a lot of fertilizer? And I think that's the topic that we're going to talk today, um, getting into sort of your fertilizer or fertility management. So if you look there, you all know there are a couple things that happen on the farm. And somewhere at the lower end is the fertilizers that you have to um, purchase from somewhere. But then we also have manures. That's the next sort of holistic plant nutrient management. Um, and then also many times we forget that there, are all, there could also be soil fertility issues that may be impacting the yield on your farm in addition to nutrients. And then other pest disease, influence, um, and then all other economic variables that happen. So just in a year, if you don't get the yield that you are looking for, most often we blame it on the fertilizer and we think there's not enough in the soil while there could be many other variables. Um, also let's talk about weather and we're going to spend some time talking about weather too. So th this is a sort of an example that if this barrel is a field where you want to maximize the maximum yield that you want to get but you're not getting what you want, more, more often we blame on nutrients. But it, there could be other factors. Water, for example, is a huge driver. And you all know if it's drought, you can add as much nitrogen as you want. That nitrogen is not going to be available to the plants. So just an example, to keep an eye on this, what's needed. And we know nitrogen is the most critical nutrient. And many times we think that next is phosphorus, but actually the next is potassium. And then phosphorus, and then sulfur. They all are tied to each other. Um, so we know that good soil fertility is needed, um, and in addition to nutrients, there are some other soil productivity issues that we often forget. Um, 
And I'm going to point out a few here. You all lime your fields, and you all know that pH keep declining because we use nitrogen fertilizers that put acid back in the soil. Now you have to add lime to bump the pH, and and so and which is a good thing because if your pH you know is not in balance, you're not going to get all the nutrients. There could also be other issues, hard layers. There could be um, poorly drained soils, and we have s several fields within uh, this upper shore area. And then, then there's also shortage of nutrients. Uh, and let's not forget the climatic conditions, uh, drought, the flooding that can also affect the yield in a given year. And all these things make it much more complicated to manage nutrients. So when we, when we talk about nitrogen, the, the biggest challenge with the nitrogen is we do not have a soil test. And what that means is you can't take a sample and figure out how much nitrogen you need, which is what makes it so challenging. And part of the reason is that nitrogen is a very complex nutrient. The microbes, they drive the nitrogen mineralization, which is conversion of the organic nitrogen to a usable form that plants can utilize. And just we also have other things going on in the in, in state of Maryland. We also grow a lot of cover crops. They can also contribute nitrogen, depending upon what's in the cover crop. Uh, we also use a lot of manure in different pots, and that can also contribute nutrients. So all these things make it much more difficult to figure out how much nitrogen you should be adding in, in a given field. Um, so there are some opportunities. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of room to improve in terms of how we better manage nitrogen. Um, and you all just heard about split application, and we all know that's actually such a good idea, but heavily underutilized. And we also need to figure out a better way to sort of account for nitrogen that's coming from legumes, cover crops. And if we know that, now you can reduce the amount of fertilizer that you need to add in a given field. Um, so this is a sort of, a, if you look at, this is corn, and th th this graph shows uh, um, th that, how, that how does corn utilize ni uh, nitrogen. Um, so in, in this example, in the first sort of vegetative stages, which is up to V6, V18, corn only needs 60% of the nitrogen that you add. And the remaining 40% is after that phase. So as an example, if you're adding all 100% right here, when there's nothing in the soil, plants can't use it. And in a year, when you don't get a lot of rain, that nitrogen is not going to move. But we also know we get a lot of spring rain. So if you get a lot of spring rain while this nitrogen is sitting outside, it's going to be lost. And that has happened many times in the past, and we'll talk about that. And another way to sort of look at would be if you have an acre of corn, how much nitrogen does corn need in one day? And it depends on where are you on the graph. Um, but anywhere, you only need one to three pounds per acre per day. And that's a really, really tiny amount. So plants are like babies. Like, so in an ideal situation, if we can go to a field and put three pounds every day, now we're getting somewhere. But we can't do that, right? So that's part of the challenge. How should we manage nitrogen in a way that we add the amount of nitrogen that plants can utilize in a day? Um, so just kind of here, you know, uh, you can see this is not corn. <laughs> um, I just threw it just for fun. Um, so if you look at sort of Maryland base recommendations, like so our recommendations are that you can add one pound of nitrogen per one bushel of corn. And you can go up to 250 pounds. But in this example, let's say that your yield goal is 200 bushels of corn. And in this case, you can add 200 pounds of nitrogen. So the first reaction that we see is, OK, let's add 200 pounds. But we also forget that the field that you're going to add can also contribute nitrogen that already exists in the field. So what, else, what could that be? One is the residual soil nitrogen that's staying in the field. Um, you all can, you may, if you had legumes in that field, that can also contribute some nitrogen. If you have cover crops, that can also contribute some nitrogen. If you added manure recently, that can also add a little bit of nitrogen. And we often forget there are other sources. If you're using irrigation water, Anyone on irrigated corn here? Anyone has irrigation system on the field? So uh, um, I know a few of you have that. That can also contain nitrogen. And that's the best way if you have that and you're sort of using irrigation water several times in a year, that can add nitrogen when the crop need. So, 
in this example, if your final base was 200 bushels, and in this case, if we can figure out how much is going to be contributed by soil and other factors, you can reduce that and reduce your, the amount of fertilizer that you need to add. I know this is complicated, and that's why we have great extension folks like Jenny, and we also have nutrient management advisors. So have a conversation with them and tell them what you are thinking, and they can help you optimize the fertilizer that you need to add. So let's just spend a little bit of time on talking about those subtractions. And in this case, the first example is soil nitrogen. And this is part of the story because soils vary tremendously, not, not only from one field to another, but also in a given year, rainfall, temperature, all those things cause variability in the amount of nitrogen that's in the soil. So it may, it's, 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 it's a, as a result, it's very difficult to figure out how much nitrogen you're going to get from the soil. And that's the grand challenge. One, one, when we figure that out, we can solve the nitrogen problem on that day. But it might take several um, decades to do that. So one of the sort of the low-hanging fruit I see is that it's the PSNT. I'm sure you all have heard about it. It's a pre side rest nitrate test. And again, this is a test that you have to think about it, that it's not going to solve all your problems. But this is additional data that could be useful in your pursuit to find the best fertilizer rate that you need for your field. Um, so in this example, you take a soil sample when your corn is six, to, um, six inches to one feet tall. This is the period, if you remember from the graph, where the corn start taking a lot of um, nitrogen. And in this case, if you do a PSNT, if the nitrate level is high on a given year, you can sort of say, okay, I'm going to get you know, quite a bit of nitrogen from the soil in that year. And in this case, if the soil nitrate level is low, and this is where you can say, okay, you know, maybe you know, I need to add more side dress rate. And this example with PSNT is with split fertilizer application, and that's the best way that you can do on your farm. Um, if you can add three, four splits, more power to you. But even if you can do two or three, that's pretty good. Um, it's more importantly, it's free. So talk to your nutrient management advisor, um, give them a soil sample, they will test it for you, and then you will have the data. So you, you have nothing to lose. The only thing you need to do is go grab a sample, Give it to them, collect the data, and keep that data. And as time goes by, you will have the data from your given field. Now, I want to say that the, anything that you do on the farm, any data that you generate, is going to be the best data for your field. No recommendations, not even in Maryland, anywhere in the country, are going to be as accurate as the data generated by your field. And I know as a soil fertility person, I shouldn't be saying it, but that's the truth. So in some ways, you have to become your own researcher on the field if you want to sort of better manage fertility on your farm fields. So let's continue the conversation. Okay, so that was for corn. PSNT is for corn. But if you're doing any of the small grains, um, you're doing wheat or barley, there's another test. It's the fall soil nitrate test. Pretty much same idea. You take a sample in the fall, and then you send it to the lab. Again, you can bring it to Newton Management Advisor. Um, they will give you the number. And again, it's free. So do it. Talking about legumes, and we all know that legumes uh, are these wonderful crops that take nitrogen from the atmosphere fix it and use it. And soybean is one of those examples of that crop. Alfalfa is another example. So if you had any of these legume crops, let's say last year, and now you're going to go to corn, you're going to plant corn, you can actually get substantial credit for nitrogen. Um, and again, if you're wondering why are you asking this question, that's part of the reason, because they're trying to sort of optimize your fertilizer management. Um, and legumes, when, you add, when legumes are added back, they have high nitrogen. Uh, if you add more nitrogen, which means this is going to lower the carbon to nitrogen ratio, that's another parameter that we use in the soil to figure out how, nit how much nitrogen could potentially be mineralized to the following crop. 
Um, and here's an example, alfalfa, for example. You can get up to 100, 250 pounds crowded. That's quite a bit. With soybean, you can get 15 to 40 pounds crowded. And this is the amount, less amount of money that you have to spend on the nitrogen fertilizer. Now, here is a caveat <coughs> that if you had a legume, let's say, last year, soybean or alfalfa, and then you planted a cereal cover crop that has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, that can fix some of the nitrogen that could potentially be available. So if you are doing this, talk to your nutrient management advisor so that they can sort of figure out what will be the right fertilizer rate for your field. Cover crops, again here, all cover crops contain nitrogen. Uh, and we just talked about that legumes are good because they have high nitrogen, and as a result, they can contribute more nitrogen to the following crop. Um, and here is another uh, value that we use in the literature, that if your carbon to nitrogen ratio of any residue is less than 20, we consider it's good. Uh, this is data from Jared Miller from Delaware, where he had rye, and, and then he had a rye cover crop, then he had a rye and clover cover crop, then he had a rye and hairy wedge cover crop. So what he found out was when you add any sort of legume like clover, hairy wedge, that reduces the carbon nitrogen ratio. And there's another important reason to add that, that if you are including any of the legumes, um, there is actually an incentive payment. So it's, 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 it's a good thing to do. Um, manure contribution, that's another grand challenge. How do we figure out how much is going to be available in each year? Um, we do have these sort of tables, and then in this example, if you added cattle manure, we think that based on the data, that about 35% of the nitrogen will be available in the first year, and then you will have 18% in the second year and 9% in the third year. So that's, again, a small amount, but it can be useful to, if you have to add less, 10 pounds less, that's, you know, whatever, five, six dollars less in an acre, and that can add up. Uh, another factor is when is that added? And again, this is assuming conservation tillage, and we, we won't get into that. That's for another day. But it also depends when you added manure, was it left on the surface, or did you actually use some form of tillage to mix with the soil? Um, type of manure also makes a huge difference. And in this example, horse manure and cattle manure, they have exactly the same amount of total nitrogen. However, cattle manure has about two times more nitrogen that's available. Um, so it's also important to pay attention what's in the manure. Um, and poultry litter, you know, if you can find it. Um, <coughs> so, it so if I was farming and my fields are low in phosphorus, this is what I will do. Get some poultry litter from lower shore, right? That's good, you're also gonna get nitrogen along with this. Do a split application get some money from Janelle, and assuming you're also doing cover crops with legume, so you can also get some incentive payment. So that's a pretty sweet deal, and these options don't exist outside of Maryland or Chesapeake Bay watershed. So, it's, so take advantage of these, these things that, that exist. So if you're adding a one ton of, um, let's say, poultry manure, and these numbers are average. That's why we always suggest that you should test your manure to have an accurate accounting of what's in it. So one ton of manure can add about 36 pounds of nitrogen. And if you're adding two tons, you're getting 70 pounds, 76 pounds. So that's a pretty good number, which means you can now reduce the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that you have to add on that field. Um, this is another huge issue I'm sure you all have seen that, that if your manure spreader is not calibrated, it's not going to add manure in different places. And it seems you know, such an easy thing to fix, but it's also a challenge. I consider it a, a sort of bottleneck in figuring out how much you're going to add. And in this example, um, you know, their goal was to add somewhere here, but they ended up adding about 15 tons per acre, that's a lot of manure that's just not needed. So we also, in extension, we also have sort of you know, guidelines and fact sheets. How do you calibrate your manure spreader? And this is something you want to do before you spread manure in the field. Um, so that's those are soil tests. Like, so I, often I hear that, what about the plant tests? Why can't we just go in the field, 
take a sample, and just figure out what's needed. Like, seems easy, but again, it's not that easy. So the, one of the tests that folks have used or attempted to use is called corn stock test. Um, so the idea here is that you go at end of the season, and that's one of the disadvantages. You go end of the season, you take a sample, and, and, the, and, the, and the idea here is that if there's a more nitrogen available in the soil, the plant will take more nitrogen. And if you test the corn plant in this example, and if it shows you there's a higher value, then you now you can go back that maybe that year I added more than it's needed. Like, so that's, that's part of the plot with CSNT. And the sample collection is not very complicated. It's pretty easy. You go six feet above. This is close to harvest, and you take the, this eight-inch segment. You want to do, again, 15 segments in the field, get them tested. Um, this is, again, like a data. This is a post-mortem test. Like, it doesn't help you in that season, but it might help you if you have sort of, you know, data for a few years. So here, here is my suggestion for you, going with that idea that you need to be your own researcher. Pick a field or two on your farm, okay? And then do this CSNT on the same field for two to three years, and as you have more data, you are going to figure out what's happening on your field. Um, and with that data, you can now getting uh, to match your nitrogen fertilizer with what plants is needed. I know it's a little bit more work. I wish it was easy. But you, you got to be your own researcher if you want to get the maximum yield on your field with least amount of nutrient inputs. So try it. Maybe do on one field um, this year, end of the uh, fall, and see and keep uh, collecting that data. <coughs> so let's just summarize. <coughs> so if you have corn, how should you be adding nitrogen to, to that crop? So here is pre-plant. Like, so this is why now we're getting into the splits. Don't add all the nitrogen in the beginning. Do pre-plant um, and then side dress and then do a PSNT test. And with that, you will know that where, where, where your nitrate level is. And then you can add your sort of you know, split application. If you can do you know, more than two, good. Even if you can do one, that can be actually very useful and because of the reasons we talked about. Um, you can also broadcast urea, for example, if you're doing side dress. Some people also use inhibitor to slow down the nitrogen release. Um, and here, this split application is your sort of insurance. So that in some years, you may not get a RAN. So that nitrogen that you added might still be available. But if you have RAN, it's not going to be there. And remember 2018? Anyone remember what happened in 2018 spring? Like, so this is what happened in 2018. Um, so this in like five days, you know, through, this, uh, through, through the state, we got a lot of RAN. And where we are, you got anywhere from seven to eight inches of RAN. And if all the pre-plant fertilizer that was added is gone now, and now had to come up with some concessions with some fields from MDA so you can actually add more nitrogen. So any pound of nitrogen that's not utilized on your field, that's your dollar going to a ditch or groundwater or somewhere. Like so, and this is, what, this is a common scenario. You all have seen figure. These are from Jim Lewis, uh, extension agent in Caroline County. This is a, his picture. This is another picture. So when you have more water and fertilizer, that's just not a good combination. And a good example here is if you have a f wet spot in many fields in, in this area, we have those. And this is where that nitrogen, gas loss of nitrogen happened in this situation. Um, so anything, the things that are working against your fertilizer dollars in the field are these. Volatilization, we, don't talk, we didn't talk about, that's a gas loss. Um, we talk about erosion or and even the surface runoff. We talk about the excess water, denitrification, leaching and runoff. And these are the things your goal should be to minimize so that the nitrogen that you added stays in the field. Um, so some take home message, do a split application. And this, now you are timing application when you need it. A good example will be, can we eat one meal a day and just skip lunch and dinner? And the next breakfast and lunch and dinner? We can't do that, right? So think about plants. Plants are much more sensitive. So we need to figure out a way to time 
um, the nutrient application with the plant growth, and that's the best way to add nutrients in the, in the plants. So here is another, especially in a year such as this when the fertilizer prices are higher, how about trying something that not, it's very hard to do and not many f folks do, but maybe some folks do is that how about you get a ton or two tons of manure, add that at a pre-plant, do PSNT and figure out if you need nitrogen, and then you add fertilizer, right? So that's now your split. And in this case, you're also diversifying the nutrient source. You're getting some nitrogen from manure, which is good. It will also be slowly available. And then you're adding more fertilizer when the when plant needs it. Um, and again, I think Janelle just talked about it, that you can also get $15 for split application. So that's another good reason um, to, to do it. And look around in the field. Are there other ways that you can sort of optimize um, your nitrogen use? And this, is, you all know Janelle, so if you don't, then get her phone number, call her, and, and see if she has that deal still available. Um, so another, my, another thing, I'm, I know I'm talking more about split application, but this is, you know, not only in Maryland, but in most of the country, there are not really good numbers, but people have estimated that about 70 to 80 percent of the nitrogen is added at pre-plant, which means that seven out of ten farmers add all the nitrogen at pre-plant, which is a terrible way to do that. And if you think about all the nutrient issues the folks have in the Mississippi River Basin is because of that. And then you have a lot of rain that's getting somewhere. So this is, if it, so this is the core nitrogen uptake, a simplified version of that slide. And in, in this example, if you added any, uh, all the nitrogen at pre-plant, then, then you're at the mercy of the weather. If you get a rain, it's going to be gone. But if you didn't apply, it can't be lost, right? Um, so here, here is another example that in, if you have spring rain and you add a little bit, and maybe you lost a little bit, but you, that's where, why you will do a side dress. Um, there are also some limitations to side dress, for example. If the fields that you are trying to do side dress never received any manure, the PSNT is not going to work. If you have a corn under irriga irrigation, it's, that test is also not good under those situations. So there are some challenges connected with that. Um, and here's another one. In the first three weeks following the corn emergence, it uses less than half uh, pound of nitrogen. And so it, it, if, we, if you add a 200 pounds here, it's, it's not going anywhere. Plant is not being utilized. You're just waiting for weather to wash away or hoping that it won't rain for a, for a long period of time. Um, so let's talk about phosphorus and you know like here we have very well established tests for phosphorus. This is not new. We have been researching phosphorus for a very, very long time. And when I say soil test, this is a soil test that you do on a field to get the FIV number. Okay. And I'm sure you all have heard about it that you know there are, there are mysteries surrounding phosphorus. Uh, um, and I think I just want to answer a question that gentleman asked before, that you know, if your phosphorus is tied up. So if your phosphorus is tied up, when you do a soil test, your number is going to be very low. You're looking at less than 25 or 50 FIV. And in many, some cases, less than 100. So if you do a soil test and your FIV is more than 100, I can guarantee you, you have enough phosphorus in the field. But there are challenges why that number could be low, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about. And this comes back to soil sampling and testing. So who's taking your soil sample, right? So that's part of the challenge. The bigger issue with soil phosphorus, potassium, and other nutrients is not taking an correct sample from the field. And that can introduce a lot of variability. There also has been research that has looked at that question, that if your phosphorus level is high and then you add fertilizers, will you get a yield bump? No, you're not going to get yield bump because there's a limitation to how much phosphorus plants can utilize. Um, so in other words, if you have done a great job taking a really good soil sample, there is enough phosphorus for the plants in that soil. Right, so that's something you have to keep in mind. But this is the challenge that, uh, this is an example that in one acre, if you look at the first sort of six inches, you have two million pounds of soil. But when you're taking a soil sample, 
and I hope, you're not sending the two million pounds to a soil testing lab, right? You're only sending a very, very small sample and you are hoping that the sample that you took represent the two million pounds of soil that exist in the field. That's a bigger challenge. So if you didn't take the right sample, you're not going to get the right number. And, then you're, and if that number is low, you're going to think your field need, need phosphorus, but in reality, it doesn't need phosphorus. And this, by same sort of analogy, if you happen to pick up a sample that's high in phosphorus, and now you think, well, there's enough phosphorus, and I'm above 100, I don't need to add. But in reality, your field actually has a low phosphorus. And that's where you see some of those sort of rumors and controversies that I added phosphorus and I got a yield bump. There's no scientific reason to sort of say that if your field has tested high in phosphorus, there is enough phosphorus in the field. So I just, I'm just going to walk quickly through that taking samples is very hard. Like we get tired from a research grade standpoint that we have to take a sample and we want to take 20 cores and there are other 50 things that you have to do on the field. It's pretty challenging to take a soil sample. But this is the best way. When you go to a doctor, what's the first thing a doctor does? Check your blood pressure, right? Easy test. And soil tests, in this case, taking soil sample is the beginning of that journey to find out if there's anything wrong with that soil or what that needs to be done in a soil. So make sure you take good soil samples. And if you have different areas in the field that you think has different soil fertility, capture a different sample. Um, here is a sort of a, slutty, a, a, a slide uh, from Oklahoma State. And in this example, they were taking an example that if you go in a field and you collect up to 25 cores, um, where is the right optimum? Like how many cores sh you should be taking from a field? And it's pretty challenging. In one acre, you can probably do 10, but if the field is 100 acre, now that becomes challenging, right? So now you have, not only you have to navigate different parts of the field, but you also have to make sure you're collecting a representative sample. So here is what they found that if you are getting less than 10 cores, you have high variability within that field. But once you get to somewhere above 15 to 25, the variability smoothens, which means you get a pretty good number from that field. And it also depends on the field that you are sampling. Um, some of the fields on our eastern shore that never received manure, in those samples, the variability is actually quite low, which is good, which means that 15 to 20 samples are going to give you a good number. But on a field where you have a lot of manure, that number may not be accurate. Um, another way to sort of better figure out soil sampling will be if you, if you find that you have some fields where you, you suspect that there's a lot of variability, then you can kind of use this approach. I know it adds more money, you have to take more samples. The good thing is you don't have to do this every year. If you do every five to seven years, get sort of grid sample from the field and then see how much variability that is. And you can use that information in future to find out the areas that might need more or the areas that might need less. Um, so here is an example. I know I'm showing a Frederick County slide just to illustrate the point of variability. So there were two pasture fields. Uh, they all were under dairy production. Uh, one was three acre, another was two acre. And we, we went on those fields and we said, let's see how many samples can we take, right? So, uh, so we were taking a lot of samples. In a three acre field, we took 18 grid samples. And another field, two acres, we took 20 samples. And the goal was we wanted to see how much phosphorus varies in this soil sample. So this is what we found. In one field, we had these 1 to 18 grids. And you can see they're going everywhere in the direction. But if we take average, of all those 18 samples that we did. No one's going to take 18 samples from three acres. Um, so in this case, our number came out. This is medium FIV phosphorus number. But if we look within those different grids, we are finding that you have actually anywhere from low to medium. So pretty good. In this case, it's low variability. Like right? So you're ranging in that uh, low to medium where we have fertilizer recommendations for those pastures. 
when you go into another pasture field, this is two acre field, and there were 12 grades when we take average, now we are finding that it's about 91 FIV. And, and again, remember that at 100, we don't have recommendations to add anything, but we have a sliding scale recommendation. So in this example, our recommendations might be 10 pounds depending upon what you are adding. But if you look within individual grades, now you have a tremendous variability within the field. So you're going anywhere from medium to excessive. So let me illustrate a point here, that if you only captured sample from the grades that are medium, like so which is somewhere here, like in two acre field, you tested and then you said, oh, I need fertilizer. And you are, the nutrient management advisor is going to look into the table and tell you how much phosphorus you need to add in this field. So you added that. However, you also had many of those grids that didn't actually need fertilizer. So you ended up spending money on fertilizer that's not needed. Like, so and another scenario here would be that if someone took samples only from these excessive categories, which are all big ones, and the number came back, and then like you don't need any fertilizer, but you know your field, and you know that you didn't get the yield that you were looking for in a field, and in this example, what happened was you had several areas in the field that needed phosphorus, but didn't get any, any phosphorus. So this is a good example why I think some of those rumors and theories started <laughs> that my field need more phosphorus. And it's, it comes back to your soil sampling. That's the key, and that's the bigger challenge. How do you do that? Um, and I, I here, w there are different recommendations depending on what you're trying to do. If you're doing soil pH, for example, on pasture systems, you only want to take the two inches. Uh, for any crop land here, um, you know, you take eight inches. If you're doing PSNT, which is the pre dress nitrate test for corn, then you should be taking samples up to 12 inches. So it gets complicated. Um, the, the, we have a new fact sheet, and Jenny can get you. This is FS1184. Uh, where um, Brian Comeback wrote this fact sheet to, to talk specifically about this issue. When should you sample? Where should you sample? How many sample you, you should you take? This is an easy four-page read, so pick up a copy. It will be useful to you. So let's summarize the phosphor. So soil pH we know is critical, um, and again, if you need add lime, many times adding lime in the fields can help correct the phosphorus deficiency scenario. And in some of the fields that are low and medium, this is another challenge. There is a reason why those fields are low and medium, because those fields have a lot of iron and aluminum. So if you add broadcast fertilizer, it's going to be fixed in different places, and less will be available to where you are planting. So here is a recommendation that if you, do a, if you band starter fertilizer in those fields, you can actually get more bang for the buck from adding that fertilizer. And this is just for this year. If your soil test is optimum, you're looking at 80, 90, you can skip fertilizer this year because the, I, the, the reason why we have sliding scale recommendation in the optimum categories is those are what we call maintenance fertilizer applications. So we want to see most of the soils in optimum category. So first, you don't have to add a lot more. And secondly, there's enough phosphorus available in the field. But if you are looking at 80, 90, I would totally skip this year if the, uh, because of high fertilizer prices. And again, if your soil test is definitely above optimum, which is more more than 100, don't add anything. But those are the right candidates, like the soils that are 100 to 130, 40, you definitely want to look at a soil test. And I know with the nutrient management plans, uh, you know, we suggest that you take sample every three years. But personally, from soil fertility standpoint, if you can and if you could, I would take sample every year. The more data that you have, more information you have about the farm, about the field, and that's gonna help you better add nutrients that are needed in that field. Again, if you're using even one ton of manure in any of these soils, you're gonna get enough phosphorus, so I, I would totally skip this year. Jenny, do I have a few more minutes? How many minutes? How many do you need? You tell me. I can wrap up right now and get everyone in the lunchroom, or I can take 10. 10 is good. OK. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about soil potassium. Like, so we do have soil potassium tests. There's a, we also have a challenge because we are growing hybrids and forages. 
that remove much more potassium. There's also an issue of depleting potassium levels in the soil over a period of time. And that has happened. There are, there are many minerals in the soil that you all know that supply potassium. So if you, if you go back and look 30 years ago, no one was adding potassium. There was enough potassium in the soil. And this is the, you know, so the, sort of the irony of modern agriculture that we have been growing crops for a long period of time, almost 10,000 years. Those fields have seen something and plants need potassium. So over a period of time, we have used up the reserves of potassium that exists in the field. The downside is that in this generation, you have to add potassium. Um, but the, it, it's, it's an easy fix. Uh, if you're keeping an eye on soil fertility, you are, you're doing a good job. Here is a sort of example that if you look at corn, for example, so when corn takes up potassium, where does that go? And I'm sure you all have seen this type of slide that most of the potassium actually in the stalk, in the straw that corn has it, um, when you harvest, it's only a tiny bit of that is removed. And what that means is everything goes back in the field, so it's recycled back and forth. And as a result, you don't need a whole lot of potassium um, in the field to begin with. There are two scenarios where you have to pay attention to potassium. So here is an example that let's see if you're doing a corn silage on a field and it's about two ton per acre. In that example, now you're removing all the silage, right? All the straw. And, and that straw is a source of potassium. That's where it removes 50% of the potassium. So if that's gone from the field, so is potassium. And on a, on a same field, if you're only growing corn grain, this is an example with 225 bushel, but if you do 200 bushels, you're looking at only 40 pounds potassium removal. So if you're doing silage versus grain, pay attention on those fields because the fields under silage, you are going to deplete potassium very quickly and other nutrients too. Um, looking at soybean is an, another example. And again, like when you look at anything that's going up, it means this is the period when it needs most of the potassium. So potassium is also soluble like nitrogen. So if you add in the beginning, it's gonna be gone uh, if it rains. So here are some, I think potassium is such an easy fix. And we don't really talk about potassium because it doesn't have any water quality angle, but fertilizers are expensive. So if it's not in the field when you need it, you lost it. Um, and the soil was the largest source, not anymore, because we are depleting. Um, again, you also need potassium later in the season. So here is an idea. Can you also do split application of potassium? I don't see a reason why you can't. If you're doing nitrogen, I, I will totally do that. Just this year, if your soil potassium level is higher, again, we're looking at 80, 90, and you're doing corn grain, you can totally skip potassium. If you're doing silage, talk to us. Um, this is again like do split application with, nit with the nitrogen. If you're using manure, is an excellent source of potassium. Any one pound of potassium in the manure is equally as available as one pound from fertilizers. So if you're using manure, you're never going to need potassium on the field. Sulfur, three, four minutes, we're going to wrap it up. <coughs> this is another nutrient that we recently started talking, and I, th I, th I think there's a good reason why we should be talking more about sulfur and less about nitrogen. So there is a, plants have a good, a huge need for sulfur, just like other nutrients. There has been depletion. We've been getting a lot of free sulfur with the atmospheric um, rain. <coughs> That's no longer the case because of our clean water policies. So its deficiency symptoms are very similar to nitrogen, right? So that's part of the challenge um, that many times we think that it's nitrogen, but it could actually be sulfur. Um, if the regular soil testing is, soil testing is not good for sulfur, but it's good to keep an eye on sulfur level in the soil. So there's a slight distinction. And, and you need it if you're gr growing any of the greens. There's a reason why this is so dark a green, because this is because of sulfur. <coughs> um, so here is an example, sulfur deficiency. It will always be on the upper leaves. Like, so that's, that's how you distinguish. Uh, nitrogen, it will always be on the lower side of the leaves. And the scenarios where you're going to see sulfur are some of the soils in this part uh, of the state. 
<coughs> you're looking at sandy soils, low pH, low organic matter. Those are the ideal soils where you're going to see sulfur deficiency. Um, so a couple of reasons why Clean Air Act, you know, better policies, less sulfur falling back with the rainfall, which means now we have to use fertilizer. There also has been changes in fertilizer formulations. And not many folks are using ammonium sulfate or single superphosphate. They naturally had a lot of sulfur already, so we didn't have to add separately. Um, there also, crop yields also have been higher in the last 40, 50 years. So, I mean, yield almost have doubled, which means they are removing much more sulfur now than they were before. Sulfur is also mobile. More rainfall, because of many reasons, is also going to leach sulfur out of the soil. So soil testing, not very good way, but it's a good way to keep an eye on the soil phosphorus levels. The best way to diagnose, this is another way to sort of think about, if you think that you have a sulfur deficiency, and you're gonna see on the field that never received any manure. So there are a couple ideas. You can actually do plant testing, but pay attention again, talk to us, because for different crops, you need to take sample at a different place and different time. But if you do that, if you really suspect that your field needs sulfur, do a test every three years at a particular stage. That's gonna give you a good idea if your field has enough sulfur or not. Um, but if you're doing soil testing, you can get that number and keep an eye on it. Okay, I think this is my last slide, Jenny. Um, so with sulfur, keep an eye on the sulfur level. Like so, um, Again, we have a couple sources. If you can also do split application, again, all the plants only take up more nutrients when they're fast growing. So if you could do nitrogen, potassium, and sulfur sort of a blend together, a split application, that's the, that's the way to go. Manures are pretty good source. If you're adding manure on the field, you're never gonna see potassium or sulfur deficiency. So ideally, if you, if you have manure available and you can rotate the fields on your farm every three to four years, you don't have to add potassium or sulfur on those fields. The only thing, and even phosphorus will be enough. The only thing that you have to add in that field will be nitrogen from commercial fertilizer source. Just wanted to uh, say hello to everybody and a lot of familiar faces and uh, worked for a lot of people here a lot of years. Um, George Ireland is still uh, there at Roosburg and Chestertown helping us manage everything, schedule everything. Uh, Janelle McHenry now is helping us as well, um, she's there in the back, um, sales so to speak of and then uh, helping me do some research of different droplet tests, different things I want to do. Uh, we've added another airplane this year and uh, we're up and going here at Roosburg and at our Chestertown location now. We also fly out of uh, John and Annabelle Taylor's uh, there in Sellersville, Marydale. And, uh, we also now have a tractor trailer because everybody is busy when it comes time for cover crops so we can haul grain if you need us to. So thank you everybody for your loyalty. I appreciate it. Hi, uh, Jay West, uh, Mountaineer Agribusiness. Um, you guys might know my voice, probably don't see my face that often. They don't let me out very much. Um, the, the thing that I really wanted to say is appreciate all you guys coming out today and uh, letting us be a sponsor. We are right here in um, Queen Anne and Ridgely. We're also in Millington, so we've got 13 places that Mountaineer Agribusiness runs, so a lot of opportunities for you guys. Um, please come see me at the booth. I'll stay for a while if we want to talk about the grain market. I'm sure there's a lot going on. Um, it, give you my opinion. Um, it is as good as your opinion because right now we are kind of in unprecedented times. So uh, we can talk about anything. I can give you the news that I know. But really just wanted to thank you guys for coming out today. What's the market today? Uh, Rachel uh, Manning is here from Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Manning. I'm a loan officer for Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit in the Denton office. So we are proud to be a sponsor here today and look forward to talking with you all if you have any questions about how we can support you in your needs, whether it be a farm loan for, line, or for equipment, lines of credit, land loan, or a ho home loan. We would be happy to discuss those needs with you. And then another thing that is convenient is uh, while we offer uh, lending to our farmers, we do also offer crop insurance. So that's really convenient to have both of those opportunities house in, in house. So again, we're uh, as soon as you walk into the other room and please introduce yourself and I would be happy to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs>